So in the last video, we kind of set up the nested logit model. We even defined it formally, but I think it's going to be useful to talk about intuition a little bit more before we get into the properties of it. And I think a lot of intuition can be built by thinking about the nested logit model as actually this two-step model. And so we're going to decompose our nested logit model into essentially two logit models, where in the first step, a decision maker chooses a nest. Remember, we've we've kind of split our alternatives into these nests. And so in the first step, the decision maker chooses one of those nests. And then in the second step, once they're in that nest, then they choose among the alternatives within that nest. So the first step, they choose a nest. And once they're inside that nest, then in the second step, they choose among the alternatives in that nest that they selected in the first stage or in the first step. And so then we can kind of think about the choice probability of any alternative. Remember, choice probabilities are important here. Uh, just like with the logit model, we're going to ultimately want to find parameters that make our choice probabilities close to, uh, close to the observed outcomes. We'll talk about that more as we go. But first, let's talk about the choice probabilities themselves. The choice probability for some alternative i in nest K, we can think about that. We're still gonna call it P sub NI, just like we did before. But now we can think about it as, first of all, the probability that decision maker N chooses nest K. So the first term here is like the, the choice probability for the, the nest choice in the first step. And then we're gonna multiply that by the choice probability. This is gonna be the probability that decision maker N chooses I conditional on being in nest K. So this is like the choice probability for the second step. So we can think about this once again as this two-step process where at first the decision maker chooses a nest and that's this first choice probability here. And then in the second step, they choose among the alternatives in that nest. That's the second term here. And so our kind of total choice probability for any alternative is just going to be the product of those two, two uh, choice probabilities, one for each step. But I think to, to make some sense out of this, we need to think about uh, the random utility model a little bit more. And in fact, we're gonna kind of generalize that original random utility model that we wrote down. We're gonna decompose representative utility into two different terms, a kind of set of attributes that apply at the nest level, and then a set of attributes that apply just at the alternative level. And so what we're thinking here is that there might be some attributes that hold for all alternatives within a nest. And so we wanna pull those out and treat them separate as the kinds of attributes that vary, um, that vary at the alternative level. And so then we're just gonna express the utility of any alternative as W, which is going to be the utility. This is like the representative utility from those nest attributes plus y, which is gonna be the representative utility of the alternative attributes. So before we would have put all of these things together into one representative utility for each alternative, but now we're thinking if there are attributes that we can specifically separate out as being uh, kind of applicable to all alternatives within a nest, let's pull those out and treat them separately. And the things that still just vary at the alternative level, we'll treat those separately. And so an example here is like, you know, just general consumer product choice. Pick a product, pick, pick your favorite product. That could be the example here. But if we were thinking about nesting products by brands, for example, so phones, maybe, you know, you got your iPhones, you've got your Samsung phones, your Google phones, your LG phones, you might want to nest those by brands. And then that W, the uh, kind of representative utility at the nest level, that could include variables for things like brand quality or just even an indicator for brand preference. If we think that there is gonna be some attribute like that that varies at the brand level as opposed to at the, the specific model level. And the reason we're gonna do that is because it's gonna allow us to write down what these choice probabilities are for the first step and for the second step. And as is often the case with these kind of sequential choice uh, kind of problems, uh, it's gonna be easier, I think, to think about them. Let's start with the second step and then work backwards from there. 
And so the kind of second step choice probability here is it's actually just, we can think about this as being a logit model. Once we're inside a step, inside a nest, and we're trying to choose among the alternatives in that nest, we can actually treat that as just a logit model, just restricted to the alternatives in that nest. And so the choice probability is just going to be our standard logit choice probability. It's just that what's going to go into the exponents here isn't going to be our V representative utility. It's going to be this alternative specific Y representative utility. So for the second step, once we're already in a nest where everything shares those nest attributes, we can kind of ignore those nest attributes, that W term, and just focus on the Y, the alternative specific representative utility. The one little tricky thing here is that we are going to scale our Ys by lambda K. And this is just like if you flipped back to the joint cum cumulative density that we, uh, distribution that we talked about in the first video, our epsilons were being scaled by lambda k. So we're going to scale our uh, our y terms by lambda k also in this uh, in this representation. But once we've done that, once we've calculated our alternative specific representative utility, scale it by lambda k. We can treat this. We we use that in the exponents and treat it just like a a logit problem within that nest. So calculating representative utility there is a little bit trickier than we're used to, but, but really the second step of this is just a, a logit problem and we already know how to handle that. So, so, so that seems like it should be easy uh, other than the, the, the trick with, with calculating representative utility. Okay, so now let's work backwards and think about the first step. The first step choice probability, it turns out, we can also treat that as a logit model. It's going to be a logit model where the decision maker is choosing among the nests. So, so now it's like each, each, you know, we can kind of treat a nest as an alternative, kind of a big alternative in, in the first step. And the decision maker is choosing among those. And our choice probability there is going to be, once again, just the logit choice probabilities. Again, there's a little bit of a trick in what we put in our representative utility. In this case, the representative utility for a nest is going to be that W, that kind of nest specific representative utility that we talked about on the previous slide. And then we're going to have to add to that lambda k times this I term. And what this I term is, is you can think about that as being the log sum term of nest k's second stage. So if you remember back to the logit model, we talked about this object called the log sum term. And it ended up being equivalent to the log of the denominator of the logit choice probability. So it's essentially the log of this denominator that I'm circling here. And what that represents is the expected utility. In this case, it would be the expected utility uh, that would come out of the second step for that nest. So essentially what we're doing here is we're adding up the nest specific representative utility and adding to it the expected utility that this decision maker will get out of all of the alternative specific representative utilities in the second step. So it's like nest specific plus the expectation of all of the alternative specifics for the alternatives in that nest. And then once again, the trick here is just that we're going to rescale up this, uh, the, this, this I term by our lambda. So I think describing this in words is a little, it might be more confusing. The math is really pretty simple. We've just got this uh, nest specific W. We've got this nest specific I term that's composed of the alternative specific utilities. And then we've got this lambda K that defines the independence in the nest. And we just make this simple, the simple uh, kind of additive form. And that's what we put into the exponents for the first step logit. 
I just want to point out one thing here. Sometimes this I term, you'll hear it called the inclusive value. Uh, I'm not really sure what the logic is between but behind the term inclusive value, but that's what it is. And that's why we denote it with an I. Um, but I think it's really better to think of it as being that log sum term of the second step. So what we have here, once again, it's just two logit models, two sequential logit models in the first step the decision maker is choosing a nest using this. And this is the choice probability that comes out of that nest where we're essentially using the representative utility is the expected representative, uh, sorry, the expected utility of each nest. And then in the second step, they choose among the alternatives in that nest where uh, once again, it's just, we can think of that as being a logit choice, but with these alternative specific representative utilities scaled by the independence of the nest. Uh, so I think, like I said, I think talking through that can sound a little tricky, but really we're just thinking about two sequential logit models uh, that gets us first a nest and then an alternative within the nests. So I think that that intuition is gonna help us see some of the important properties of the nested logit model. Um, if, if, if that's not helpful for you though, hopefully the properties may, maybe just reveal themselves uh, and, and make sense anyway. But what we're gonna talk about in the next video are these properties to show why the nested logit model can be so uh, useful when compared to the, the standard logit model that we already know.